What's the purpose of having schools? To educate, to control, to make better citizens, or to create robots? Face it, some teachers just can't teach, and some lesson plans just don't work. Do we test students too much or too little? Is a diploma worth the paper on which it's printed? Public schools, the curse, the curve, or the savior? On CounterPoint with Gerard McClendon. What's the purpose for schooling? Educate, make better citizens, or create robots? Do schools need a drastic overhaul? I want to thank you all for watching CounterPoint. Call us at 844-777-9311. Tweet and send Facebook comments to Gerard MC. And at the CounterPoint today, we have Dr. Angela Wells and Dr. Joy Patterson, and they both teach like it's an emergency. Thanks, you both, for being on the CounterPoint. We really appreciate you. Ladies, I want to start by saying this. We have history, don't we? We yes. do. We, we have do. history. And we could tell some stories when it comes to children being educated. And I want to go through some of my pet peeves today. And, and some of my pet peeves may be some of your pet peeves. And so I start out by asking a series of questions today. And then we'll, we'll dig down into some of the more intricate nature of these questions. Uh, first of all, What's the purpose for having schools? Some people think the schools are uh, babysitting complexes. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the most part, sometimes they serve in that capacity. Uh, some people think the schools are just social places to interact. Some people think the schools are a place to sell drugs and to start a fight. You know, and so I'm going to start with you, Dr. Joy Patterson. Why do we have schools? What's the purpose of having a public school? Let me share a story. Uh, when my son was in high school, he told me that school was interrupting with his educational process. Wow. And I had to explain to him why school was important, not just because I was an educator, but it was because of structure. And the school that I sent him to at the time, it was about structure, forming relationships, learning how to work in groups, learning how to be productive, you know, and preparing him for real life and a work life. Yeah. And there is some value in school. Not every parent has the resources to find things outside of school. Mm -hmm. So school can serve as that place, a repository, for not only the basic things that we talk about, ELA and math and things like that, but resources beyond that that you as a parent may not have exposure to. Yeah. So it kind of gives you a level playing ground for where you can find resources by which to learn and grow and be exposed to resources. So Dr. Angela Wells, do you agree with Dr. Patterson? You know, I, I think about this a lot. Do we have schools to educate children or is it to control them? Is it to make better citizens or to create robots? You know, uh, do, do our schools somewhat of a safe haven for children who may come from a neighborhood that's not so appealing? Yes, I do agree with Dr. Patterson and I do think that we're preparing our students for our current society and real life. And we're also um, helping them to develop social skills. And being a, a principal uh, uh, recently, I look at the students that come to my school and they come from um, some of their homes where um, they may not feel safe and there may, there may be some things going on in their, in their homes where they come to the school and they feel safe while they're at the school. So the school is a safe haven for a lot of our schools as they come during the day because right. sometimes they don't want to go home because they feel safe at the school. Okay. Right, so it does serve more mm -hmm. than a purpose than just your reading, writing, and right. arithmetic depending on what you need. Right. But it can mm -hmm. be, as you say, controlling, a means mm -hmm. of control, a means of assimilating. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why we have common core standards and yeah. things like that so that we can assimilate mm -hmm. and uh, that we train you to and train. And I use the word train. And mm -hmm. normally we associate training with animals, right. you know, so that sometimes we can train you in a certain fashion. Mm -hmm. But for many other kids, it offers a very different experience. So both of you are doctors. 
Uh, both of you have worked as teachers. Mm -hmm. You've also worked as professors, and mm -hmm. you've also uh, operated in an mm -hmm. administrative capacity where you've been the executive of a school corporation mm -hmm. or a school building. Mm -hmm. So who is at fault for a failing school? Now, now there's enough blame to go around, right? We can say, oh, these kids are bad, or there's a low-income area, or the property taxes are jacked up, or the teachers and the parents and the... Eh, ah. Who's at fault, Dr. Patterson? I may get in trouble for this, but I say parents are at fault. And I say this because of accountability. You can have kids at a private school, and those kids thrive. You can go to an inner city school where the kids are performing below level. The kids at the private school are not any smarter than the kids at that low performing school. They don't have higher IQs. What they have are parents who are paying mm. and therefore holding everyone accountable. So if I'm paying you know, $700 a month, $1,000 a month, I'm going to hold the principal accountable. I'm going to hold that janitor accountable. My kid is not going to sit in a dirty classroom. Right. I'm going to hold my kid accountable. You know, so from the principal, teacher to my child, everyone is going to be held accountable because that's an investment. So parents in a lower socioeconomic don't always feel empowered yes. to come into a classroom, debate with the teacher, say, I don't like this, I don't appreciate this. They don't have necessarily the resources or feel the comfort level to be able to do that. So therefore, the accountability level is lower. So what we have to do when we serve that population, we have to stand up for the parents who may not be able to do that. So now it's an administrative responsibility. Oh, okay, so now we're in loco parentis, right? Yes. We're, we're in the place of the parents. So Dr. Angela Wells, a child can't read by kindergarten. A child can't read by first, second grade. Child still can't pronounce sight words by third grade. You're the principal of a school. What do you do? Do you, do, are you the mother now of this child? Are you the one that says, okay, I don't care what's going on at home, but you're in my school now. Mm -hmm. What do you do to get your teachers to the point where they actually believe in loco parentis? Um, I think it's our responsibility as educators to get uh, the professional development that we need to uh, meet the needs of the students because I think that um, becomes priority. Uh, we have to uh, provide, look at some assessment, um, assessments needed for the students. Um, and then we also have to look at some assessments needed for the teachers because the teachers may need some uh, professional development so that they will know how to meet the needs of so the students. So teachers need PD, they need professional development, mm -hmm. and not only do the students need to be assessed, but the teachers need to be assessed as well? Right. The, uh, the administrators have to go around to the classrooms to observe teachers and find out what their needs are so that we can service them as well so that they will be able to meet the needs of the Dr. students. Dr. Angela Wells, that's not happening in a lot of schools. I know it's a mandate. I know we got Charlotte Danielson. We got Framework for Teaching. We got Common Core. But it's like some schools just don't give a darn. I'm not going to visit my teachers. I'm going to hang out in my office all day and make my little phone calls and be on Facebook. Some teachers aren't getting that oversight and you can almost judge a school by the climate when you walk down the hallway you can kind mm -hmm. of feel it some schools you walk in it automatically feels like this heavy cloud mm -hmm. you know you can walk into a school you know that the children run the school mm -hmm. you can walk into a school and you know that the teachers have some jacked up lesson plans. Mm -hmm. So what do you do, Dr. Angela Wells, as an educator and as an administrator, when you think that one or two of your teachers may need a little bit more PD or may not be writing well-crafted lesson plan or unit plans? Then they need assistance with lesson plans, and that's really um, one of my uh, strengths. I, I think that um, teachers need uh, lesson plans because with lesson plans, uh, that's a key area that uh, teachers need to to create lesson plans that are that are effective for students. And a lot of times with lesson plans, you have to develop your lesson plans. Uh, sometimes teachers present 
information to students. And I've, I've noticed, um, and, and the research says that teachers uh, present information uh, to, to students rather than uh, creating lesson plans that promote uh, higher order thinking skills. And um, we have to go back to what we've learned about the old Bloom's taxonomy mm -hmm. and begin to teach children about um, applying information, analyzing information, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, synthesizing information. Mm -hmm. And that's probably uh, part of the problem. And a lot of times uh, allowing students to uh, do more than recalling and, and getting them involved and motivate, motivating mm -hmm. them to want to uh, learn. And when they're able to do things and giving them a voice as a part of the um, uh, lesson lesson that you're teaching. So there's it's more than just coming into the classroom and just presenting the information. You have to do your research and look at what your students' interests are and look at what their needs are, looking at their learning styles, looking at all of that. And that's some of what's not going on in the schools because p teachers aren't taking the time to look at their the interests of their students, to look at the student needs and looking at their learning styles so that the students will be motivate, motivated and want to become a part of that. I, I got about our one or two minutes left in this segment. Mm -hmm. You ladies are tearing this thing up. I, I want to ask you this though, Dr. Patterson, because she, Dr. Wells, led us into a very interesting territory here. When you, when a child, when we, let's look at Bloom's taxonomy, you just mentioned it, but what if the teacher tries to start two or three rungs above where the child is in Bloom's? What happens? Oh, you're going to trip. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just like running up the stairs, you know, and I always tell my students, our goal is to get to the sixth floor. You know, you might have different limitations. Somebody may even have to take the elevator to get there. Mm. You may not get there at the same time, the same way, but you need to get there. But when you miss those steps, you know, as you're teaching, you have to assess what you taught. You know, I can't teach you at the knowledge level and then assess you at the application level because then we've missed some steps. But oftentimes, we just teach at the knowledge and the comprehension level. And because we do that, retention doesn't build in. Uh -huh. Therefore, learning does not occur. So we're teaching at a level that they may have already mastered yes. or there. And so, and if we don't push them further up that taxonomy, you know, uh, we're, we're uh, putting the student in a situation where they, they're stifled, they're, they can't, they're... Yes, and the bad thing... And then you're asking for behavior, behavioral, behavioral problems. Yes. False sense... False sense of security for a student who think that they have mastered something mm -hmm. when they're really behind their counterparts. We're going to talk about this after okay. the break. So giving away too many stars, mm -hmm. too many hearts on the paper, mm -hmm. giving away A's, uh, patting them on the head saying, good job, but yes. you're in seventh grade and still can't read. Absolutely. Wow, wow, wow. Stay with us, ladies. What's the purpose for schooling? To educate, make better citizens, or create robots? Do schools need a drastic overhaul? We'll be back in a minute. Tweet me, post on Instagram, or send me a message on Facebook. Let's start the conversation. Your voice is important on CounterPoint. Welcome back to CounterPoint. I'm Gerard McClendon. Call 844-777-9311 or Facebook or tweet me at Gerard MC. What's the purpose for schooling? Educate, make better citizens, or create robots. Do schools need a drastic overhaul? Dr. Angela Wells and Dr. Joy Patterson try to convince me that good public schools are a necessity. I hope you can do that, ladies. Absolutely. I really do. Can we curtail the dropout rate. In some larger inner cities, we're looking at 45, 50, 55% dropout mm -hmm. rate. Students are checking out their sophomore year saying, I'm not going back. They end up doing crime, doing dumb stuff. How do we keep students in a school for the duration of the 12th grade year? So having alternatives. I believe if we look at the process of identifying a kid for special needs and we look at this bell-shaped curve of what's normal, mm -hmm. in order for you to get assistance through something like an IEP, 
you know, an individual education program, then there has to be there has to be a huge difference, okay? So of where my IQ is and where I can function at. And so that mm -hmm. difference is what determines if I get an IEP. So if I have a, a IQ, and let's say my IQ is in the 80 range, mm -hmm. and maybe so cognitively I'm somewhat delayed, and I'm functioning there as well. So I may not qualify for additional services, yet I'm struggling, right. you know? So I'm working at the capacity in which my IQ says I can work. Mm -hmm. Those students are destined to drop out of school. So we can actually pinpoint that. We, we, we can pinpoint We can predict that. who's gonna drop out? Yes. We can predict who's going to, a large percentage of who is going to drop out and we can actually intervene and provide alternatives for those students, provide a trade or some other opportunity mm. because that student is going to continue to fail. As you said earlier, what happens if I'm behind the class? I'm clowning around, I'm acting up because I have to save face, yeah. you know? Yes. Uh, and so people know me as the class clown. Yeah. Uh, because I'm not going to be caught reading because I can't really read. Right. But I don't want Angela to know I can't read. Right. Right. So, uh, so what happens? I I get further and further and further behind. It's embarrassing. And it's a lost cause to stick around in the school and actually finish complete the next grade. It doesn't even make sense because the embarrassment oh, it it the embarrassment becomes the emphasis, and it's like why should I be embarrassed anymore? Correct. Correct. So okay. I want to ask you this, Dr. Wells. In some school corporations, children are introduced to, let's say, algebra mm -hmm. in sixth grade, mm -hmm. fifth grade. In other school corporations, the students may not be introduced to algebra until ninth or tenth grade. Why is that, Dr. Angela Wells? Is that an expectation issue? Well, um, I think it depends on the curriculum of mm -hmm. the school, mm -hmm. and, um, and and I don't think that that's fair for the for the students because I think that all students should have an opportunity to um, participate in algebra if they, you know, so that they'll be prepared mm -hmm. for for um, so that they'll be prepared to move forward, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think that some schools have curriculums, and, and I don't want to... No, I'll just say it. <laughs> you on counter, you're on counterpoint. <laughs> see, see, I got you loosened up now. You can say whatever you want. You are in a safe space. It's just the three of us. Nobody else is going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What do you want to say? I, well, I just think in, in certain types of schools, they have certain types of curriculums, yeah. and that... Um, and some people don't have the advantage of having. Right. Um, I'm just trying to keep it clean. The certain type, certain type of schools have certain type right. of curriculums, and they don't get that Again, advantage. And, and having yeah. low, yeah. I'll mm -hmm. say it, having mm -hmm. low expectations. Right. <laughs> and uh, as mm -hmm. I said, it's unfair to the child right. because I haven't oh. been mm -hmm. exposed. So now right. I graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. I have a 4.0. Mm -hmm. With that 4.0. I am going to college, mm -hmm. and at the end of my freshman year, I am coming home. Yes. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. And I'm registering at the local junior college, and nothing wrong with the local nothing. junior college because I started there. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you're back <laughs> yeah. at the local junior college because you were cheated. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you had the capacity, mm -hmm. and someone robbed you of that, mm -hmm. didn't yes. even expose you to it. And, and, and it's, you know, you can have, uh, there's lots of studies about kids who go to preschool. Is preschool making a difference? Mm -hmm. uh, so we looked at preschool and third graders, and we found that preschool and third, there's not a big difference if you've gone to preschool or not. Mm. Because there's a big difference in first grade, because you were never exposed. You know, at home, my parents could only afford five colors. Mm -hmm. You know, in preschool, they had a hundred, the box with 120 crayons. So I know more colors only because I was exposed. Magenta. Yes, not because your <laughs> IQ is greater than mine. You yes. just had more exposure. Yes. So by first grade, I'm still behind. 
but I have the capacity as long as you're giving it to me. So third grade, we're on the same level because now I've been exposed to as much as you've been exposed to. You know what, Dr. Patterson, this is interesting. And I know that Dr. Wells is, has a heart and affinity for young people and reading. Mm -hmm. And 20 minutes a day, every day reading, you'll read over a million words a year. Some children don't have that access. So quick rapid fire question for both of you. We have a nine month school year. It's archaic. It's based on farming. Uh, Dr. Angela Wells, do you think that the school year should be longer? Or do you think, should it be more than nine months or should there be a three month break in summer? What do you think about that? Um, well, I think kids deserve a break to have a vacation, but I think that um, depending on the needs of the students, it could be um, longer. Some, some schools could be, um, have some additional time. We have summer um, school for some kids who may need it or some programs that have I include mm -hmm. some summer school uh, programs for the certain topics the kids may need. What determines? So, so a child uh, isn't reading well, let's say by third grade. Right. And then we have this thing called SP, social promotion. Oh, That's yeah. a, I got to pass that kid. Oh, you know, my baby getting kind of tall. Don't you dare flunk my child. Don't right. you dare hold my child back. So what's the that. threshold, Dr. Wells, of when we keep a child for an extra year or give child remediation? Because it's frustrating when you see a 17-year-old junior in high school that cannot sound out words. How does that happen, and what do you do when in the earlier childhood years? Well, yeah, like, like a couple of years ago, we had some students who, some kids who were, um, he, a, a student who was at a certain age, and he, uh, we were going to hold him back because he w he wasn't reading at the level that would help him to be successful for the next year. However, he was too old for us to keep back, so we had to send him on to the next level. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't going to be good for him because he wasn't going to do well for the next year. But those kids who are at uh, the lower levels, if they aren't reading well, and we know they aren't going to be successful, we hold them back. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we need to begin to... Um, Come, that's why I uh, really believe in looking at kids um, at their earlier years, looking at their needs, looking at their strengths, and um, looking at student strengths and using their strengths to promote uh, their academic performance. Right. Yes. So if we use their strengths to promote their academic performance, then we'll be able to help them to achieve um, academically um, yeah. and be successful. Because a lot of times we focus on their deficiencies and we shouldn't focus as much on their deficiency. Look at their strengths and then that'll give them uh, a higher uh, self-esteem level. And then I think we need to do that. And then we'll be able to see students um, move forward successfully. So ladies, I'm running low on time. Do you believe that there is this buzz term of school to prison pipeline. Do you oh, think some oh, yeah. schools are feeding their students, their third graders who can't read, who become sixth graders who can't read, right into federal prison? What do you think, Dr. Patterson? Well, we know what the stats tell us. And mm -hmm. so we know in the state of Indiana, between the age of 18 and 24, we have uh, more black men, especially in prison than in college. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that there are some facts. And now that prisons have become uh, a business. Mm. Where is the urgency to put a stop to that now that this has become a business? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that when you are a teacher in the classroom that you feel like you are a part of that system mm -hmm. at all. Right. I think a teacher comes to work every day and think that they're doing a good job or trust that they're doing a good job. So I think many of the issues have to do with accountability if you're doing a good job. And there are some schools that are doing a really poor job. Yeah. And that's why we have this issue. Yeah. I think that we really have to um, look at our, our administrators really have to begin to look at how we can help our teachers understand how to help our kids. Because our kids are having a hard time 
because our teachers are still trying to teach the way they've been teaching for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that um, last year with my teach, I, I, I was an administrator in Illinois, and I noticed my teachers, um, they have a hard time wanting to change. That's what's going on in our schools. Teachers have a hard time wanting to change. Yeah. They want to keep teaching the way they've been teaching. Just lecture, just lecture. Just lecture. And we have to begin to look at, at how our students learn. And, and you have to look, and you have to begin to change the way you do things. You can't keep doing things the same way. And then when you come in and tell them that you, that they, that you, we need to have change, then they get, they don't want to make that change. You know what, we gotta do a part two with you ladies because we didn't even scratch the surface today. Thank you for ending on that note because I didn't get to some children who think their mama's name is mama and who think their brother's name is man man. And the, <laughs> and the other point I wanted to make was this. I cannot stand schools that have metal detectors mm -hmm. and schools that have a lot of fights. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get to that yes. later, Dr. Patterson, Dr. Wells. I went to spectacular public schools but some children don't have access to great teachers, build Buildings and neighborhoods. It's time we shift the focus back to quality public schooling to foster knowledge, citizenship, and creativity. Thank you for watching Counterpoint. Stay positive, keep your head up, and always be encouraged to voice your counterpoint. Have a great week.